This is episode 116 of the Death to Tyrants podcast. Hey guys, let me tell you about the sponsor for today's show, and that is Lorenzotti Coffee. Oh my goodness, it is so damn good. I kid you not, I found myself the last few mornings waking up earlier than normal just because I'm so excited to drink this coffee that the guy sent me. It is so good. Let me tell you about them really quick. They basically import coffee from a roaster in Naples. Well, now they've got it on their website. You can order it. It is so damn good. They've got ground, whole bean, anything you like over there. And trust me, you won't be disappointed. I do it in the French press. That's how I make my coffee every morning. And I'm so stoked to have these guys as a sponsor. They love Liberty. They love the Death to Tyrants podcast. And so we should support them, right? We want the good people to get our money. And when you go over to Lorenzotti.coffee, that's L-O-R-E-N-Z-O-T-T-I dot coffee, and you use our promo code at checkout, D-T-T-P, for the Death to Tyrants podcast, you get 10% off your order. And they are not expensive, guys, but boy, it tastes expensive. You will not be disappointed. Our sponsor, Lorenzotti Coffee, L O R. E-N-Z-O-T-T-I dot coffee. Go check them out and use promo code D-T-T-P at checkout. Let's get to the show. The crushing weight of the tyrant's passage has left nothing unmarked. You can't split in fucking half, but I call him the hologram graph. But I am the center inside the placenta of math. You clash with cyanide gas and die fast. Rhythmically equivalent of solids, liquid and gas. We smash your science with the power of Lord but I am the virus inside of the iris of Cyrus. What's up, you guys? Welcome back once again to the Death to Tyrants podcast. As always, I am your host and humble narrator, Buck Johnson, coming to you out of Austin, Texas. I'm so happy to bring back on today one of my absolute favorite guests. The president of the Mises Institute is here, Mr. Jeff Deist. And uh, when uh, you get to the intersection of brilliant, badass, and cool that's where Jeff Deist stands. And I brought him on here to talk about the culture wars that we're witnessing right now in this, in this country. And it is a topic that I find it's really important, to be quite honest with you. And it is a topic that a lot of libertarians have a tougher time navigating through. It's not the stuff we're used to talking about. Well, Jeff is excellent on this topic, and that's why I brought him on here. He's excellent on every topic I've chatted with him about because uh, he's that damn good. I will waste your time no longer. Please welcome the president of the greatest organization on the planet, the Mises Institute, Mr. Jeff Deist. Welcome back to the show. How are you? Well, thanks. It's great to talk to you again. Yes, sir. How are things down at the Mises Institute? It looked like, despite the current madness, you guys had a really good week uh, at Mises U. Well, we have been having live events. We're, we're proud of that. It, it's not that we have some contrarian streak where we don't care about COVID. It's more that uh, we recognize that, you know, statistically young people, especially under 30, are virtually untouched. And so we were able to have our live Mises U summer event here a little over a week ago. That was an absolute blast. Um, had some really enthusiastic young people. So that's always, you know, it's, it's just, uh, it makes me feel better when I see or feel like we're having an impact out in society, however small that may be. It can be very frustrating for people who think like you and me sometimes, and especially with the lockdowns, people are isolated. So it's, it was great to be able to get together. And then just last evening, we hosted a great, uh, really brilliant and very brave alternative health advocate named Bill Sardi. Uh, we had a really yes. good turnout at the Institute. He spoke a lot about supplements and COVID and uh, what's going on with vaccines and that sort of thing. And so there was just a lot of, you know, a different kind of view. He's not an anti-vaxxer by any stretch, but just a different kind of view as to whether, you know, there there are things you can do to boost your own immune system. And nobody out there in the media is talking about that. They're all just talking about masks and distancing and vaccines. And it's it's a crime that they aren't talking more about what we can do ourselves. Because look, there's two ways you get antibodies to deal with a virus. One is you inject them into your arm via vaccine, and it's got to give you a big enough dose to get you at least a little sick to create them. Or your, your own immune system sends out signals when it comes in contact with the virus. So 
obviously, as liberty minded people, we we can see that the state is screwing this up, that the media complex is scaring us, that the medical profession is going about this all wrong. And, uh, you know, one thing I love about the Mises Institute is that we're, you know, we're willing to take these things on and and uh, and talk about them. Yeah, I, I look at you you and, and the Mises Institute in general as sort of a lighthouse in this world, because even within the liberty world, things can become muddied and directions lost a bit. Obviously, in the regular world, that's kind of par for the course. But the Mises Institute and yourself, you guys are always kind of grounded and able to move those of us who can find you in the right direction. And so I want to talk about a topic that many libertarians aren't used to navigating with ease, and that's the culture wars that we are witnessing right now, because, you know, it's not just monetary policy or drug policy or foreign policy. There's a lot of nuance and a lot of language manipulation that's going on right now. I'd like your thoughts on exactly what we are seeing right now in this country as far as the culture wars go, and how would you describe it? Terrible. It's probably the anti-culture wars, really, because that's, that, that's how I view the left increasingly is just a de-civilizing force in society who wants nothing um, other than chaos. And so culture becomes weaponized through the state and the state's enforcers, which I would consider universities and most media. So the, the reason we have to worry so much about culture in this country is because, you know, it's being weaponized against us. I, I would consider myself and my political beliefs right libertarian. I don't shy away from that. Libertarian is an adjective in this sense. And so I do think that there is a place for family, for intermedi- intermediating institutions, for religion, for civil society of which uh, markets play a huge role. So I don't draw this big distinction between, let's say, private charity and markets. I think it's all kind of bound up in one big enchilada that we call civil society. So I think that, you know, libertarians have tried to ignore the culture that we're all sitting in, that we're all steeped in, and it hasn't worked. I think we live in a very illiberal time. The right has its own illiberal views, of course, but it doesn't have ascendant power. That's the chief difference. And uh, there's nothing about being uh, someone who is liberty-minded or interested in economics. There's nothing that requires us to be blind to reality. We don't have to lie to be liberty-minded. That's, that's not in the manual. <laughs> you know, I mean, so when, when we look at something like Black Lives Matter, I can just say that's an anti-property movement. Whether you're talking about the official... Uh, communists running a particular organization or website which receives donations, or whether you're just talking about the more peripheral supporters, including some, you know, suburban white mom in Portland or something, you know, however you slice and dice it, it's an anti-property movement. And that is, you know, the illiberal by definition and illibertarian by definition. So I, what I don't like is when people want to lie about things, when people want to evade the truth, either because they're just being too thick to see it or because they make some sort of weird fetish out of grandstanding about, I'm not neither left nor right. You know, I'm a libertarian. Uh, Okay. But you live in the world or you ought to. If we're going to get anywhere, we got to live in the world. And, um, you know, there is a culture war. I do see people mock that and say, oh, you know, these right-wing culture warriors. Okay. I, you know, but I, I think you're going to find that aggressively secular post-Christian America is pretty hostile place to live. You know, that's that's just the truth. And I say that as a, as someone who's personally an agnostic, but who understands that you can't so neatly separate materialism. And I don't just mean grubby, you know, get a Ferrari materialism. I mean material abundance. It gives us wonderful health and medical treatment and abundant food and you know, raises people up out of poverty, that kind of materialism. You can't separate that from capitalism. You can't separate capitalism from the West so easily. You can't separate the West from Christendom, which birthed it so easily. Uh, so, I, you know, if, if uh, some libertarian wants to call me a culture warrior or say that I'm you know, I'm some Western chauvinist. Too bad. <laughs> You've said on this podcast before that the left is serious and the right is not. <laughs> and I've, it's interesting after you said that, that 
that was the first time, you know, it's like hearing a, a new word and then all of a sudden you hear it everywhere. I heard people echoing that sentiment quite a bit and I have since then. Do you think there's been any indication at all that elements on the right or maybe even just what we can call middle America are becoming more serious? Or do you think the fear tactics of mob rule and cancel culture and whatnot, does that scare people too much? It's so hard to say because we don't really have data. The idea of a silent majority is very hard to pin down. It's definitely not 1968 with Nixon. It's it's not the same. There were riots in 67 and 68 and I'm, getting, I'm reversing this maybe in Detroit first and then Newark in 68. And those had a really profound impact on Nixon's winning the presidency because a lot of people thought, oh, well, whatever that is, I'm not for that. And this, this Nixon guy who wears black socks with his wingtips and shorts is, is the guy, you know? <laughs> so is that happening again? And is the right going to get serious because they realize what's happening. Well, it's pretty hard to get serious if that Cato poll of a couple of weeks or that Cato study, I should say, of a couple of weeks ago is, is true, where it says everyone's totally terrified yeah. of actually openly discussing their own politics at, at work, for instance. So I don't know. I mean, because we all have our little social media bubbles with it that create our perceptions, you know, when we have our, our sort of our ear to the ground. So I don't know. I, my my media bubble is probably too self-selecting to say for sure. But um, I, I, when I said the right isn't serious, what I meant is when they say they're going to get rid of abortion or abolish the right. income tax or, or get rid of the Department right. of Education, they, they don't mean any of that. But when the left says we're going to have universal basic income, they mean it and, and they I- intend to get it. And they've gotten lots of things over the last hundred years, the progressive century. So I don't, um, you know, I, you got to give them some credit because folks on the left are willing to work incrementally and they're willing to work toward things which may not materialize until beyond their own life. And yeah, so that, that's, what, that's why it, they win. Yeah, and they're able to somehow convince elements of middle America, like you referenced the Portlandia soccer mom, to march in the streets with a group like BLM. I, I find that, impressive on their part that they're able to mobilize people in this fashion. Well, there's look at let's look at the trans issue, which Obama really put the pedal to the metal towards the end of his term. And some people think that that may have helped Trump win that because there's a lot of people in that LGB end of things who themselves are a little uncomfortable with the T sort of glomming on to their movement. Yes. They think transgenderism is a very different thing than, let's say, uh, the ability of two gay men to get married. And so when you look at the T part of it and you say, well, what, what percentage of the country is transgender? Very tiny, less than 1%. Well, okay. What, but then let's go on around that to their friends and family who care about them. Okay, maybe you get to 1% then. And then you say, well, what about people who – are not trans, don't have any friends or family who are trans, but are hugely sympathetic. Okay, then you get three, four, five percent, you know, so you keep sort of building out these concentric circles. And at some point, you got people with power and influence in society, let's say celebrities. Uh, You got the president of the United States, someone like Barack Obama. You got uh, corporate America to increasingly come on board. So even though there was some unease and tension in the LGB side of it, you know, the, the transgender issue won the day with really the the serious support of a very small percentage of the American population. And that's something where I think libertarians can look at that and say, you know, we don't need 51%. You don't need to capture the entirety of the United States. You know, a, a really dedicated cadre of 5 or 10% could move mountains, but that 5 or 10% has to have some juice in society. It can't just be a bunch of 16-year-old at home or something like that. It has to be some people with influence and money and celebrity and status and, you know, business success, impressive people, smart people, et cetera. But there, there really is a lesson in there. I mean, if imagine if, okay, let's say 30 years ago, Clinton, is Clinton president? Yeah. Uh, or, or Clinton's almost president 30 years ago. And you say, well, at some point around that time, there coalesced this, at first there were, uh, domestic partnerships and civil unions. And then at some point, a gay marriage movement sort of evolved out of that. You know, imagine if 30 years ago, libertarians had said, we are going to get rid of the income tax. We're going to do it by hook or by crook. We're going to do it legislatively. 
if we can't do it that way, we're going to do it with the courts. If we can't do it that way, we're going to do it through pressure on corporate America. What, whatever we have to do, we are going to get rid of the income tax. Just like some people said, we are going to have gay marriage recognized in this country. And then 30 years later, you had that success and there was no income tax. I mean, there really is an amazing lesson there about organization and coordination. And, and I, I'm a huge believer in single issue coalitions, however fragile, however short lived. I mean, if that coalition is just like, you know, all if a Black Lives Matter person says, let's get the hell out of Afghanistan because we need that money here in the United States to deal with our domestic problems, you know, sign me up. Gotcha. Okay. That's that actually, that brings up a point I wanted to ask you about. Do you, you know, back in the mid nineties with Chairman Rockwell and, and Murray Rothbard, there was the paleo libertarian kind of coalition and, and Pat Buchanan was in that fold briefly. I know we don't really have the paleo movement, so to speak anymore to any large extent, but do you see a more friendly audience to Liberty on maybe what are, people are calling the populist right uh, as far as forming alliances uh, rather than the progressive left? No question. Absolutely. I think people on the right are increasingly waking up to the idea that they're never going to control the state apparatus, the federal state apparatus and direct it towards their purposes. I mean, at some point you have to just accept that, that it has been completely captured by just bureaucratic inertia, if nothing else, but also well, I, I don't like the term deep state. I like the term regulatory state. It's right out in the open. I mean, Trump is openly defied by members of his own administration. When you, know, when, when you get into office, there's too many of them. You can't fire them all. You can change the heads of certain departments and agencies and maybe a few layers down, but the rest of them have unions. I mean, there's millions of them. So, so that's, that's the government. Trump is not the government. Congress is not the government. When we say the government, we mean those roughly three million odd people who work for the federal administrative agencies or your particular state's administrative agencies. They're the permanent government that governs you. It doesn't really matter so much what laws get passed. That's, that's almost secondary. And so this is, this is something that I think the right has figured out a little bit. I think you can talk to a person on the right about, hey, you know, there ought to be spheres of human activity which are not political, which are not uh, subject to the jurisdiction of, of federal, state, or local government. that are completely outside of that, like uh, whether you braid somebody's hair or uh, how late you serve alcohol or, how, you know, what you pay employees for a wage, these kinds of things. And, and, you know, you'll get some nodding along on the right. You can go to a Trump rally. And you can say, we need to get the hell out of the Middle East. And you'll get lots of nodding along. You won't get that at a Biden rally. There's clearly more fertile ground on the right. And I, you know, a lot of people are going to disagree with that. I get it. But it, again, this is grandstanding about being neither left nor right. I don't care. I, I don't, ideologically, of course, libertarianism is, is neither left nor right. That's not the point. Do you see an underlying lust for violence from the modern left? Yeah, it, it sure seems so. And I hope that a counter-reactionary lust doesn't build for that. I mean, you could get into some horrible tit-for-tat situation. And, you know, this is why we have to push at least aggressive federalism, if not outright secession, because people still don't want to admit to themselves how ugly this cultural divide is. Not so much, it's not really a policy divide. There's not that big of a difference when it comes to a substantive policy between a Trump and a Hillary Clinton. I mean, they pretty much believe the same things. It's, it's very much a cultural divide. And that's, that's every bit, if not more serious. And when people want to be dismissive of secession, oh, that could never happen. Well, you know, when you think about the alternative, which is an, a hot civil war instead of a cold civil war, then it becomes less unthinkable. And look, there are I don't want to call them normies, but there are certainly much more run-of-the-mill people on both the left and the right talking about it openly now. Uh, Frank Buckley, who's a great law yes. professor at the Scalia School of Law, George Mason in Northern Virginia, has a, a new book. It might be almost a year old now and talking about this. And he's not a fan of secession. He's not an advocate of it. He's not some sort of wild-eyed person, but, but his book is a very sober uh, look at that possibility. And so this is – this is the future, I think, if we are going to have a peaceful one. Yeah, I actually had him on uh, this very show to talk about that book. That God, it probably was about a year ago now. Mm -hmm. I wanted to ask you about this specific topic. I uh, Let's see, it was Thaddeus Russell that I asked recently about secession. Of course, he's of the mind that it, it's a nice option and that hopefully we can do this. But his fear was that it would not be, it 
may not be peaceful because there's not been a lot of peaceful secession movements. Do you think we are headed towards a place where maybe peaceful is a possibility? I hope so. I mean, that's what I would say to blue state progressives is that you could have so much more of what you want right here, right now in big, in vast cities across vast swaths of the, of the U S population and, and whole states could have so much of what they want right here and now, if you were just willing to let go, not maybe not even all, but a degree of this centralized federal government. It's so obvious. It's staring everyone right in the face. And the reason progressives don't go for this, by the way, is because they think they're winning. You know, that's loser yeah. talk. We're, we're the route, you know, they think that they're going to route the country. So why would they let any of it go? That's not a progressive mindset. It live and let live, <laughs> right? I mean, right. progressive mindset is rule and that's it. So th- they're not much interested, but I think the Trump election and the Brexit election were both shocks to them. And I think amongst the more thoughtful folks on the left, I like to read Harper's. I like to read New Republic. Uh, sometimes I sort of grind my teeth and read Jacobin. Mm-hmm. And the more thoughtful ones are kind of starting to get this, that there's more deplorables than they thought, and they're dying off slower than they thought. And so this becomes a thorn in their side because we're going to have these pesky states, these red states or whatever, for, for longer than we, we wanted. So that's, that's very interesting to think about. Now, if, if, you get, if Biden wins in the fall and you get if, – if, Florida and Texas were to turn blue in the Electoral College map, or if we get rid of the Electoral College, which is, by the way, as an aside, a potential civil war inflection point, um, then, you know, then I think the left is going to say, no, 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 this is our country now. And nobody can win the presidency if, if, if we've got Texas and Florida and New York and California. I mean, that's it. So that's probably what they're thinking. But if somehow Trump manages to win in the fall, whatever that looks like, I mean, my God, that'll be some crazy disputed election that takes three weeks where the mail-in ballots and riots and all kinds of stuff. But I mean, let's just say hypothetically, he, he won by a recognizable amount. And, you know, then we could make real inroads, I think, with the left on this issue. Yeah, I completely agree. Let me tell you guys about another sponsor for today's show, and that is Lucky Guy Bakery over at luckyguybakery.com. The brownies are insanely delicious, and they make excellent gifts. They do little gift boxes over there. The logo is awesome. The packaging is really well done, and each one has a handwritten gift note, a very personalized touch. And obviously with the lockdown and COVID mess that's been going on, you're missing a lot of birthday parties and graduation parties. This is a really cool way to send gifts to someone. Let them know you're thinking about them. It's from luckyguybakery.com. They've got an amazing selection of brownies over there starting at only $22. And that's before you get the discount from being a fan of this show. You get 20% off just by putting in DTTP at checkout. They're award-winning brownies. They've been featured on the Today Show. They're one of the top five bakeries in Indiana. Lucky Guy Bakery is, according to Yelp. They got best mail order brownies as well. Obviously, in 2020, you know some of your family members and friends want the gluten-free ones and vegan options. Well, they've got all of that. So go to luckyguybakery.com, enter code DTTP at checkout. You will get 20% off. Guys, Let's support these small businesses that support libertarian podcasts like this one. Once again, luckyguybakery.com, promo code DTTP at checkout. You won't be sorry. I want to get into libertarianism a bit and the culture wars seeping into the liberty world. It seemed like with the Ron Paul revolution years that it kind of brought a lot of libertarian factions back together that when there was a split previous because Dr. Paul was so good at not only messaging, but just kind of living his principles. And and a lot of us felt more of a unification with the Liberty world. Now these things are splitting up Hmm. kind of back like they were because of this culture war stuff again. What do you make of libertarianism as it stands now, meaning the movement, not necessarily the philosophy? Yeah, that's a very tough question. Uh, I think the sociology of any movement becomes the movement. You can't separate 
a movement from the people within it. So I think as a result, libertarianism has moved left. Now, when it comes to Ron, you, you talk about divisions or factions. So let me inflame a few of them. Yes. You know, the reason in Cato people never liked Ron Paul, they never liked him from the start because he talked about gold and the Fed and foreign wars and things they didn't really want to talk about. And he was this sort of upright country doctor from Texas, not their cup of tea, not a cosmopolitan. So there's always been a division there. And of course, there was a falling out with Rothbard and the Cato folks, which is the, the effects of which are still felt today. And so this has always been there. But the reason Ron was a unifier is because he's not the caricature that some people have of him. He's not, you know, he's not some religious fundamentalist. That's just absolutely not true. His, his, his religious beliefs are pretty quiet, frankly. He's not animated by social issues. He, he just isn't. He really cares about life and death. Uh, you know, he, he really does care about abortion. That's a heartfelt thing. It's not, it's not a pose. And, but he cares equally as much about deaths in wartime. That's, that's very heartfelt and it's not a pose. And I think that came through. I think it bled through. I think the fact that he wasn't sort of quaffed like Romney and he didn't have all these sound bites and he didn't, you know, he gave the same message to any group. He didn't sort of pander or shade things one way or the other. You know, he had a lot of endearing qualities and his, he was actually a skilled politician in the sense, in the, in the most important sense, which is just sheer likability. I mean, likability is something you can't buy or focus group. And he had that. I, you know, I don't know exactly. I can't put my finger on it entirely, but he had it. And now we don't have that. So I think I think the cultural war that's raging in the country is just reflected within the, the libertarian movement. And a lot of it comes down to the idea of property versus egalitarianism. Those are the two poles, yes. and they are opposites. And that, to me, is the dividing line. And so. I don't know how you get around that easily. I mean, you can say that you believe in both, but emphasize one or the other, I suppose. But I, I think property is just incompatible with an egalitarian mindset. And that's, um, that's, to me, what libertarianism has become. It's sort of like a self-actualization movement rather than a movement rooted in property. One of the bizarre online trends as of late is this weird cry from progressives pining for libertarians and Second Amendment people to go up to Portland and defend the leftist protesters from the federal police because, you know, libertarians are against the state and this is the state mm. swooping in on these, our friends on the left. You penned a wonderful, wonderful piece over at Mises.org on this. I want to ask you several things about it. What's your broad assessment of this and, and how you respond to this cry of, where are all of the libertarians to defend us now? Well, yeah, I get it. We all like to point out hypocrisy in others. That's, that's the, the very, something very human about that. But if pointing out hypocrisy in politics worked, it would have worked by now. <laughs> um, here's the thing. I do think that there shouldn't be any federal police, identified or unidentified and spooky in Portland. There shouldn't be any federal buildings in Portland as far as I'm concerned. Now, some people say, well, there's got to be a federal courthouse. I get it. And, and look, I have friends like Kevin Goodsman who would say it is entirely legitimate for the federal government to use federal officers to defend federal property if, in fact, the state and local government either asks them to come in or has failed to defend it, that that's you know, almost like a federal embassy or federal land. Okay, but that's very different than having federal cops sort of just randomly on the streets and all that. Now, there's some differences of, of opinion as to the facts here. Were these, were these guys actually unmarked or did they have uh, recognizable, I guess, Customs and Border Patrol or DHS uniforms? You know, were they really taking away people to secret locations in, in violation of habeas corpus without any due process? Or were they, was it just sort of a, a quick release detaining them to try to, you know, bring down the, the volume at a protest. I, I don't know because I wasn't there and I can't just believe something that I read about that. But, you know, I, I think the left has a valid beef here. There's something very spooky about that. And if we're going to argue for states' rights and federalism, then we ha yes, we have to be consistent and we can't just say, well, because I don't like BLM or Antifa, I sort of turn the other way when the feds come in and start knocking heads around, you know, no. But I do think that state and local officials have 
ought to have sovereign jurisdiction of those areas and they ought to be able to say, no, the feds can't commit. The, the problem with the left saying that is they'll never say that about the EPA on your land somewhere. You know, they'll never say that it's legitimate for a governor to deny the EPA access to some place where they want to come in and do an environmental assessment or something that, you know, so that goes both ways. They cheered the feds when it came to the Bundys. You yeah. know, so so both sides do this. This is there's some whataboutism here. You know, we get that. So, but I would agree with the with the underlying objection about the federal armed presence, cops, whatever you want to call them, agents in in Portland. I, I don't think that's right, and not just because of what the Constitution says, but from a, a libertarian perspective, I think that's not right. We ought to argue uh, emphatically and consistently in in favor of local control. Especially a police. Yes, yes, certainly. It it seemed as if that had to be almost like a top down message. There was way too many blue check mark people making this cry who don't know any libertarians to begin with. I found it interesting that all of a sudden, you know, for lack of a better term, our name is in their mouth. And something just seemed odd. I I don't know if this was some news organization pushing this message, but I assume you must have seen it. It seemed ubiquitous to me. You must have seen it around a lot, yes? Maybe some news organization did put it, plan it. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it, it, you uh, know, all of a sudden this this crops up. Yeah, and it's it's still even, I you know, I didn't think much about getting into this, but I assume you saw the recent death of the libertarian young man in, in Austin here. He was with, marching with BLM, and I'm still seeing people kind of put that out of their mind that live here in Austin and ask where the libertarians are to defend BLM protesters. And it's like, well, one just died doing it. So it's the whole thing, the irony of the timing and, and everything, is, it's, uh, it's interesting. Yeah, yeah, that is that really is something. And um, that's something to think about. I mean, we, we, we don't want people dying in the streets. I mean, that's, <laughs> it, that's a bad thing. And it, from what I've read, from what little I've read, this was a young guy. And that's yes. th that's too bad. So you know, how do you how do you make something good out of a death like that? I you know, I'm not sure you can, other than to say, hey, everyone, let's let's sort of scale back the the violence. Do you see things getting worse before they get better? Yes, because of what Congress and the, and the Fed have done. Congress has been juicing things with this additional six hundred dollar a month weekly unemployment. And for a lot of people, that has been basically their, um, you know, safety net, and that is set to expire or at least be reduced. Now, Congress and Trump can can change that and extend that, but man, at some point, you have to say, you know, Congress had budgeted to spend something like a little over five trillion dollars in the twenty twenty fiscal year, and bring in maybe four trillion for a one trillion dollar deficit. Well, now they're going to spend eight or nine and maybe not even bring in the four. So you're going to have a deficit that's, you know, 100 percent or greater than the amount of taxes brought in. So, I mean, unless you're an MMT or that's clearly unsustainable. And what the Fed is doing on its end in terms of propping up markets is just absolutely unprecedented. It is absolutely different, not only in in magnitude, but also qualitatively different than what they did in 2008, where they just bought treasury debt for the most part and mortgage-backed securities. Now they're buying all kinds of debt, including municipal bond debt, corporate debt. They're buying Walmart debt. Pretty soon, they're going to be buying stocks. Don't kid yourselves. So the Fed is propping up markets in a way, and Congress is propping up you know, wage earners in a way that give us a sense that things are not as crazily falling apart as they are yet. But, you know, especially with the mask people and the COVID people sort of doubling down on this fall canceling football, canceling school, you know, at some point people have to get up in the morning and produce goods and services if we're going to have goods and services. You can't just expect there to be everything you want from CVS, everything you want at the grocery, all kinds of meat, uh, everything you want at the gas station, you know, the banks functioning normally, Walmart's got all your stuff. And, you know, your little mom and pop restaurant that you like, yeah, they're shut down for a while, but they'll just come back online when this is all over. I mean, no, at some point you have to realize that unless people get up and produce, it's 
we're in for a great depression. And what's so scary is that they're doing a great job of conditioning people. And a lot of Americans love this, the idea of just sitting home and getting paid by the yeah. government. I mean, a lot of Americans yes. say, well, look, you know, now I finally have the, you know, this frees people up to do their, you know, follow their hopes and dreams. They really want to be an artist or they want to be a dancer. Or they want to be something for which nobody wants to pay them, by the way. So, <laughs> you know, in the meantime, what's missing is, of course, medical care, and they intend to fix that via Medicare for all. So we're all going to have a giant DMV system for health care. So, you know, they, the, you know, you got to hand it to the left. In the 1930s, FDR, some folks in his administration went over and visited Russia. And they came back with this vision of a truly progressive country in their heads and thought, well, wow, you know, FDR himself wasn't much of an ideologue, but the, so a lot of the people around him really had a profound influence on him. And so that when the Depression came along, uh, especially in 32, they were able to use that crisis to, to radically transform the United States over, let's say, the next 10 years. So I think our friends on the left intend to do that with COVID. They said, yo, who, who could have guessed we'd get some weird virus emanating from China? But now that it's here, what can we do? And so they have a whole laundry list of things they wanted anyway. And they're doing a hell of a job of using this, uh, what I would consider manufactured crisis, that's my opinion, to get what they want. Yeah. I, you know, I'm, I'm here in Austin and uh, a lot of my friends are, a lot of them are what we would call maybe mid-level musicians where you're playing multiple gigs a month at bars and maybe pulling in $2,500 a month and living in an apartment. I have actually seen them, some of them say, look, until this virus goes away, the government's job is to pay us to stay home and people don't leave your house. So the mindset is out there. And, you know, when you're in a bubble, like I, I am sometimes with <laughs> libertarianism and the Mises crowd, you see that and it's like, is this person serious? Like you wonder how, how that could seep into someone's mind to think like that. Yet, I, unfortunately, I think it is probably a more popular thought than I might have given it credit for at first. Well, you think of a town like Austin that's got so much live music, so much food, so many bars. I mean, what, what does this mean for Austin? Is it going to take 10 years to return to normal? I mean, I, I have no idea. Will it ever return to normal or w will it return to normal in six months? I mean, what's your sense? This is, this is crazy, the idea that all these musicians are, are sitting at home and all these bar goers and concert goers are sitting at home. I mean, I, I'm not sure people understand how profound this is. No, I, I don't think they do either. But there's this strange thought from people maybe uh, not as educated as far as economics go that we are supposed to just stay home because there's a deadly virus out there. And the government, I don't know that these people would even use the term MMT, but that the government's job right now is to pump out money to pay us because they're protecting our health in this manner. And so, yeah, I've actually, I've seen, like I said, I've seen musicians say it. I've seen bar owners uh, say similar mm. things here that, that I'm friends with. And I think I don't understand the mindset of that. And, and there's also, of course, the opposite. There's a, I'm in a, uh, just to kind of read the comments and, and politics involved, I'm in a Texas bar owners group on Facebook. And those people are done with this mess. And they're actively protesting uh, for, for Governor Abbott to, open, you know, it's like the 51% business, they call it. If you're 51% of your business is alcohol, right now they're closed. They are furious at this. In fact, they're calling, you know, a lot of them, I would say at this point, think they're to the right of Governor Abbott and they want him ousted. And I, you know, think, well, look at California. I don't know, you know, if the other option is the Democratic candidate, it could be worse, much worse than it is in Texas right now. So yeah, it's it's fascinating. There's in one by one, like you mentioned, there's these little favorite restaurants, uh, local restaurants here, small ones, and they're closing. And you see people, the same people that promote the lockdown online. Oh man, we lost another one. And it's like, yeah, we did because of the politics and the and the government mandates that you're for. And and they don't. There's some kind of disconnect there. Well, the Main beneficiaries of the lockdown are, of course, the biggest corporations in the world, Amazon, yes. Walmart, et cetera. So, you know, do you want Austin to be a bunch of olive gardens and no little right. restaurants? I mean, 
and you know, no offense to the Olive Garden, but that's that's right. where it seems where we're headed. Yeah, no doubt. Um, in closing, I, I, I mentioned earlier that I I see you guys as sort of a lighthouse uh, for those in my audience who are stressed about the way 2020 is going. For those who aren't sure, I don't know if this no government or minimal government liberty thing is the way to do. The country seems to be collapsing around us. The cities are burning. Maybe the mobs getting a little, like you mentioned in your speech, the guillotines getting a little close uh, to their own house. I don't know. What message would you send out to those people wondering how to navigate this madness? Well, there is another side to all this. There, you know, there's our perception and then there's the reality. You know, we can't 100% know the reality with respect to this virus, but what we do know is that it appears to be awfully, awfully safe relative to other influenzas and, and colds for people under about 50. So we could be back to work, you know, maybe with some minor adjustments. Uh, if you want to wear a mask, wear one, some more, more routine hand washing or whatever. But people under about 50 could just be back to work tomorrow. And that, that I think is the message we have to get out there because it's kind of like there was a hurricane and we're not being let back into the neighborhood yet to assess the damage to our house. That's sort of where we are right now. We're in this zombie sleepwalking phase where nobody really quite knows how bad it is. And we're getting some very nervous assurances from, for instance, Jerome Powell at the Fed, but you can tell that he doesn't really know. And people are talking less and less about a V-shaped recovery that was on everyone's lips maybe two months ago, three months ago. But now we're facing maybe another lockdown going into the fall. Um, you know, every day that goes by is a lot like a drowning victim. You know, the longer you're underwater, the more likely that you're not going to be resuscitated. And that's how I feel about the economy right now. And so, you know, whatever voice you have at the local level, I, I would say use it. And, and part of that is just, you know, get up and go out and do it. Uh, there's a lot of this is in a very gray area legally. You know, there are some cities like Miami, which have been is issuing fines for not wearing masks, but there are plenty of other cities where the police or even the mayors or the county officials have just sort of shrugged and admitted that they don't have legal authority in the sense of actual legislative uh, authority to do what they're doing. And so they're just sort of hoping everybody complies. So don't, you know, don't just take that at its face. Take a look at it and find other like-minded people because, you know, there's nobody looking out for you. There's not some sort of magic government that deep down it, behind the scenes is taking care of everything so that when this, when this is over, you'll be okay. And yeah, maybe there'll be some weirdness. You have to readjust your mortgage or something like that. But, but eh, you know, I mean, that's, that's, if you look at history, that's a pretty dangerous assumption. People in government right now are worried about themselves, just like you ought to be. All right. That was well put. Uh, plug away now. Is there anything you guys got coming up at Mises or uh, any, any media that we should know about? Well, we got a lot of stuff going on. We've, we've been managing to have live events. We'll be in, in Ron Paul's part of Texas, which is Lake Jackson, about an hour south of Houston. Later this fall, we'll be in Jekyll Island, Georgia. Uh, later this fall as well, when the, where the, the Fed was conceived. We're going to be down in Orlando, I guess, in about a month from now. And um, I'm going to be in Dallas, Texas at a Young Americans for Liberty event, which I believe is not this weekend, but next. Uh, so I'm looking forward to that. I, I hope that that doesn't get shut down because of COVID. That's, that's at an Omni Hotel in Dallas, Fort Worth, if anybody wants to check that out. But mo probably most of all, we're excited about our new master's program, which was going online this fall. And it's going to be a real uh, a real master's degree in economics, you know, from the Mises Institute at very, very low cost and entirely online. So that's, uh, you know, that's something that we're excited about. You can find us at Mises. You can find me at Jeff Deist, all one word, J-E-F-F-D-E-I-S-T. So I'd always appreciate new Twitter followers. Excellent. I will link to all of that in the show notes page for this episode. Jeff Deist, thanks so much for being here once again. Thank you for having me. All right, guys, I hope you enjoyed that chat with the coolest of the cool, Mr. Jeff Dice. Stoked to have him back on the show. As for us, you know where to find us. But if you don't, if you're new, and there are a lot of new listeners out there, I've seen these download numbers uh, jump to levels I had not expected this quickly into the game. So if you are new, facebook.com slash death to tyrants podcast. 
You can follow me on Twitter at Buck Rebel, B-U-C-K-R-E-B-E-L. Let's see, what else do we have for you? Oh, yeah, you can become a supporter of this show at patreon.com slash death to tyrants. And if you do, many of you know this because a lot of those numbers have jumped as well, but all you do is donate even a dollar. You can donate more than that, obviously, but a dollar gets you into the club and about once a month, we are going to release an episode exclusively for my Patreon supporters. And uh, we're working on episode two, you guys. If you're listening and you're a Patreon supporter, episode two will be out in the next week or so. We're going to be working on that. The topic at hand is uh, I've already got it locked and loaded. It's going to be a good one. And uh, that's about all I got for you guys. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Until next week, I'll see you. You get split in fucking half. Cause I call him the hologram graph. But I am the center inside the placenta of math. You clash with cyanide gas and die fast. Rhythmically equivalent of solids, liquid, and gas. We smash a sinus with the power of Lord Titus. But I am the virus inside of the iris of Cyrus. Like the sound of the Death to Tyrants podcast? Our audio production is provided by Podsworth Media. Check them out at podsworth.com.